Here we are at the third piece, third song in the Wall album. And this one is titled Another Brick in the Wall Part 1. It flowed directly out of the thin ice, which flowed out of In the Flesh Part 1. So it's a continuous line of development. We haven't yet come to a full stop. Now in this song, this is the first one on the album that consists almost entirely of muted mellow tones with a lot of echo and reverb effects applied, along with a highly repetitive hypnotic style of, of music writing. It's very different from the hard and harsh aggression and bitterness of the first two songs. This song is a reflection, a looking back to the beginnings from a future vantage point, which at, at this point has not been musically articulated or revealed to us. What we see here is seen only in the mind's eye. It's indistinct, echoing in the chambers of memory, we could say, from another world, another time. And that is what is being implied by all the echoey, watery, reverb, sound effects of the song. We're in a state of, we could call it daydreaming, hypnosis, meditation, however we want to describe it. But in this song, we are only aware of what we are reflecting on. We have no consciousness of where we physically are. The music doesn't tell us where we are sitting right now in real life. For us, we are back then, back there, living every moment of those experiences that we are recalling. And there's practically no development or going anywhere happening throughout this song. Well, there are a handful of harmonic changes part way through, some chord shifts later in the piece, which give a little shift in the music at key moments, but still it doesn't travel. It doesn't go somewhere. This communicates two ideas at once. The first one, which I alluded to a moment ago, is that wherever we are physically in this moment is entirely irrelevant and unobserved. We are not moving, we are not active, neither is our experience progressing. We are simply existing in our memories. Second, and this is very important insofar as it concerns the topic of this whole album and the message of this song in particular, the things that are expressed here in this song stunted us, halted our growth, caused us to get stuck and be unable to develop or progress. Notice the rhythmic pulsing of the bass. If I were going to try to compare it with something, I might say that it feels a bit like a train clicking down the tracks, or if we try really hard, we could maybe imagine that it's hinting at a heartbeat, but I don't think that it's meant to sound like either of those, or anything in particular. It is simply a musical element placed there to give us a certain kind of sensation, the passing of time. What we have in this song is both very static and yet, while its effect halted progress, time continued and continues to pass. Which, of course, forces us to notice that for every moment lost in this experience, opportunities are being lost forever as well. Opportunities to grow, to recover, to heal. When someone's life is such that they end up in this kind of condition, it's tragic because the effect is not something fleeting. 
not something that comes and goes and we can continue as if it never happened. At the very least, in the most positive outcome imaginable, even if recovery and healing is eventually found, the time spent in that state has been lost forever. And yet, I have personally seen miracles that defy imagination. What I mean is real individuals whose lives were stunted through no fault of their own, and when finally given the opportunity, defied all odds and made up for lost time. But I don't believe that we should use these stories to hide the truth of the tragedy of what has truly been lost. And this song helps us to remain honest in that respect. Now, I hinted at some important harmonic moments in this song. If we start at the beginning, we have a simple D minor, which goes on and on and on. And the voice sings in a reflective, lost in the world of memories tone on just three notes, barely enough to be called a melody. Very close to a chant or just simply the thoughts, meditations going through the mind. Riding the gentle ripple and tide of a sea of memories. Let's listen to it. This D minor is our harmonic bass. And you hear the guitar down here on that rhythm. And then above this, here's the melody. All I'm using are these three notes, and it continues. Nothing more than that. We're just here in this space, this moment, this world of reflection and imagination, there is no progress. Daddy's flown across the ocean, leaving just a memory. In the movie, while his mother is seeking for consolation or direction in her own loneliness and devastation, Pink is in the world of memory. Even trying to remember things he never saw or experienced firsthand, but which have deeply impacted him. It's as if he is looking for connection, something tangible, some way to reach through the void and feel what was and what he senses should still be. The airplane, the awards and decorations, the flag, which Pink looks to with admiration, every now and then, he picks in on Mama, but he is unable to connect to her experience, rooted as it is in having known and having lived. And so he eventually turns his back and leaves. From the very beginning of this song, we understand that it's all about the consequences of his father's loss. Snapshot in the family album, Daddy, what else did you leave for me? This three-note melody continues over the D minor all the way until we arrive at Daddy, what else did you leave for me? On that word, me, we have not only the first change of harmony in the song, but also the first time the melody travels beyond a simple walking step difference in pitch, going to a larger leap in distance, and the first time the voice moves out, outside of this original three note range. hear it all happening at once. This is our D minor. And 
the voice leaped, the melody went outside of this range up to here, and we had the harmonic shift. Each of those firsts might seem like such a small, insignificant thing. But because of all that was set up in the music up until that point, and the fact that all three of those firsts happen at the same moment, and furthermore, coincide with the turning of attention from daddy to me, it is a moment of massive significance in the music. It tells us that all this reflective memory thought process about daddy are not just memories, but there is something incredibly personal, incredibly important, having to do with me in all of this. And of course, that moment is followed by the desperate cry of daddy, what'd you leave behind for me? Reiterating, but also changing the perspective slightly, revealing a bit more about why it's so important. Pink has a deep need, and he's looking for it. He feels like Daddy could have filled it, or could have provided something that would meet that need, and he feels left behind. This line does not ask what else, but what did you leave behind for me? He never says that Daddy died. No, Daddy's flown across the ocean. Meaning, Daddy is no more. But how, where, is not relevant, as the child cannot comprehend the reality of death yet. But Daddy is gone, and he, Pink, the child, is left behind. And there is no answer to his question. That's all that there is. Now, I want to insert a little side paragraph here, because one of the things I've learned along the way is that Roger Waters is vehemently anti-war in his views. And in addition to the other messages and topics that we are tracing in this song, this opposition to war is also very visible, very evident. Is Pink reproaching his daddy for leaving him? It might sound like this at first, but no, not at all. Rather, the emphasis is placed on the fact that by Daddy having been sent off to war, he, Pink, the child, is left with nothing more than the snapshot in the family album. War is what took everything away so that Daddy could leave nothing behind. Even if Daddy would have wanted to, and I believe it's presented that he did want to because just in the previous song, Daddy loves you too. But he cannot, because death is total and irreversible. Waters is very deliberate and careful to communicate the nature and horrors of war and its crippling effects on generations to follow. I've listened to a couple other songs which also communicate strong anti-war messages. Brothers in Arms by Dire Straits, and Child in Time by Deep Purple, these each have their own angle. Here in Another Brick in the Wall, the focus is on the family tragedy, and especially on the next generation, the children of war that are left behind to stumble on as best they can. So back to the song. After this question, what do you leave behind for me? We hear no answer, no response to the question at all. Instead, the conclusion, almost like a resigned shrug of the shoulders, all in all, it was just a brick in the wall, followed by a long section of instrumental music mixed with distant children's voices, which functions as a continuation of the reflection, the memories floating through the mind, what else is there to do than that? I'm sure you've already watched my first listen. Well, if you haven't, here's the link to it. And 
Many of you are still asking me in the comments if I am going to do the entire album. Yes, and I've actually already recorded the first listen of every song in the album. If you want to access them ahead of the scheduled release time, you can do so by going to my Patreon or Coffee page. But remember, I listened to the entire album before going back to do an in-depth look at each song. So it's been a while since I did the first listen. But you'll probably remember that I was a bit confused when I first heard this song. I didn't really know what to make of it, what he was really talking about, and especially why he included those children's voices in the end portion of the piece. I knew they must be important, but I didn't know exactly why. After watching the movie, though, it made perfect sense. I know that Waters didn't love everything about the movie, but I feel like it is really worthwhile to see it, even though, just like movies based on literary works, it only gives one interpretation. So we do have to be careful not to become so fixated on what is being fed to us that we miss other interpretive opportunities. But I found the movie to be particularly illuminating in regards to the last half of this song. Remember this chapter began with In the Flesh, telling us about the entry into this world. And then the thin ice forewarns us of the dangerous nature of life. And now in this part one of Another Brick in the Wall, we are seeing how the isolation and alienation begins, began. In other words, how the wall began to be built. This is what we find after the last dismissive words of this song. All in all, it was just all bricks in the wall. What is this? What does he mean? And remember, this last half of the music goes on and on for a long time in the same hypnotic, empty dream world style. There's a sensation of being lost, alone, out of touch, aimless, and along with this, layered with this, the sounds of happy childhood playground life. I didn't know what to make of this at first, but the movie helped to clarify for me. Pink is alone in the middle of the children, even more. He's rejected. He doesn't fit. There's no place of belonging for him here in this society. Let's watch these scenes. He enters the park and feels so lonely in the middle of the crowd. But he wants to be a part of society and he is asking for help. The gentleman does not, of course, understand why he is alone. But after he gets his answer or explanation, he helps Pink to integrate. Notice that as soon as Pink is up on the merry-go-round, he is smiling. This is the first time I see a genuine expression of happiness, comfortable enjoyment, and it's expressed by his smile. But Pink wants more than to be integrated. He wants personal connection. And the next scene is absolutely heartbreaking. The child in front of him is caught in his father's arms as he comes down the slide, but there's nobody to take up Pink. He doesn't lose heart, though. He still believes that he can be one with the others, and he wants it so badly. Now, not only is he pushed away, but even as he fights against this attitude and tries again by going back and attempting to hold the gentleman's hand. Society has no interest in what is happening to him anymore. Is not asking him questions anymore. No longer trying to understand his needs, but instead is pushing him away. He's an interference. He doesn't fit. He doesn't belong. He doesn't know how to behave in this society. Notice how the second time the gentleman tries to get rid of his hand, 
Pink holds on to him. He is craving connection, human connection. The final scene. All the children are flying on the swings, but there's nobody to help Little Pink. He tries valiantly, but he is, we could say, disabled. Why? How? And the message is, his father is missing. The means by which he could have become part of society, could have built connections, friendships, could have learned critical social skills, and been helped along the way in learning to cope. And all of that is non-existent for him. As we look into his eyes, there on that swing, looking at the others which are different, we can see how the wall starts to grow. He is not like them. He cannot be like them. He will never be like them. Now, going back to the music without the aid of the movie, of course, this whole playground saga is not explicit. It's even a stretch to say that it's implicit, but the overall message is implied. And that is why we hear this strange layering of absence and isolation and emptiness in the music with the happiness of the children. But you'll notice the balance of sound. The children's calls are distant because they are out of reach for Pink himself. The music here is not bitter because Pink has not yet grown enough to become hostile and alienated. He's still hopeful. He's still innocent. He's still a child, still reaching out, craving connection. But these are the experiences that formed the first bricks and set them in place. I'll see you next time.